if we're ready to study the Word of God right here. Oh, yeah. For those that are visiting us the first time, we've uh, been engaged in a study of the book of Luke. Just a powerful study in looking at Jesus and his dream to evangelize the world in that generation. A little background. Obviously, Luke was most likely a Gentile. You can tell that from his name. And yet, because Paul did not request that he be circumcised to be on his missionary journey, we surmise that he was a Jewish convert that got circumcised and then later became a convert to Christianity. Of course, his background, as recorded in Colossians chapter 4, is that he was a doctor. But by hanging around Paul, he became an evangelist. And of course, he had a special heart. Some of the very last words that Paul writes are about Luke. When he's in prison, he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, Luke alone is with me. Most likely, it was during that imprisonment that he was able to write what we call the Luke X series. His themes, of course, are joy, money, healing, and of course, preaching the word not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles, that Jesus, in fact, was the Savior of the world. Now, I know how much this group hangs upon every Bible study that we have. And so I'm confident that you remember back on February 3rd at our Super Bowl Sunday, we studied out Luke chapter 7. Amen, guys? And so we're going to be building on that knowledge, and we're going to be jumping into the part of chapter 7 that we did not study at that time, and then going into chapter 8 today. I've simply entitled the lesson, The Multitudes. There are four points. Number one, pleading with the multitudes. Chapter 7, 18 to 33. Proclamation to sort the multitudes. Chapter 8, 1 through 25. Number three, persecuted by the multitudes. Chapter 8, 26 through 39. Number four, plans for each in the multitude. Chapter 8, verses 40 through 56. Let's get started. Luke chapter 7. The text reads in verse 18. John's disciples told him about all these things. Well, of course, that's back in reference to the centurion that had the faith to understand that all that Jesus had to do was just say the word and his servant would be healed. And Jesus said, this man has greater faith than I've seen in all Israel, and he was a Gentile. It's also referring back to the widow's son, her only son that was raised from the dead by Jesus, and then the ensuing uproar in the surrounding cities. And so we're told in verse 18, John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they asked, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Wow. Right here, we understand from Luke chapter 3 and verse 20 that John is in prison. And he is beginning to doubt. Is Jesus really the Messiah? And so he sends two of his disciples to go check it out. Why did he send two? Well, obviously, Deuteronomy 19, verse 15 says that truth is established by two or three witnesses. John the Baptist was out after the truth. That's the only way to chase away doubt. Jesus, in verse 21, is recorded, at that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. Now, the, the Greek here is, is really incredible. When it says that he gave sight, the word right there, the verb, actually is translated to give freely. It's ikri sato, which we get cheris from, which means grace. And so you can really translate this, he graced many with sight. I mean, that's just the Lord, amen, guys? And we read this then. Verse 23. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you've seen and heard. 
The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Well, he's referencing back to the scripture in Isaiah 61 in chapter 4 that really showed what the Messiah was all about, that he would come and do these things. Amen? And then he says that last beatitude, blessed is the man who doesn't fall away in economy. You know, sometimes we minimize where John the Baptist got to. Right. John the Baptist wasn't just doubting who Jesus was. He was in danger of falling away. Look at verse 24. After John's messages left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out in the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury and palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one of who is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Now right here, Jesus is speaking to his first multitude. It says, after John's messenger, Jesus began to speak to the crowd, the multitude. Now, he's talking about the ministry of John the Baptist, and he compares it to the kingdom. Now, one of the things that we're going to see in a few moments that happened to John's heart, and probably to a lot of his disciples was they were confused was Jesus the Messiah because he did not come breathing hellfire and brimstone. He came with his gracious words to quote Luke that now is the time of God's favor. Now, John the Baptist himself he laid it on out, amen guys? And Jesus references that. And he says he was the greatest of all the prophets. As a matter of fact, he says he was the greatest of all men born of women before the start of the new kingdom. But as awesome as he was, even the least in the new kingdom, the new Israel, is greater than he. Is that incredible? Amen. And so, we read on. All the people... Even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' word, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and experts of the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. I think that most of us fail to understand how impacting, how comprehensive was the entire revival in all of Israel by John. It basically says in this crowd that everybody, almost everybody, was baptized by John. This is incredible. And so why was Jesus saying this to the crowd? Because if John the Baptist was doubting, and they saw his messages come to him, most likely word had spread to all of his disciples up there. John's doubting. Oh, now I'm doubting. Well, what were they doubting about? Well, very simply this. Jesus was not what they expected. The kingdom was not what they expected. And it caused them to trip. The actual word for fall away in the Greek is the same word that we get the word scandal from. It means literally to trip. And many people who claim to be disciples trip up on who Jesus is and what the kingdom of God is all about. Amen. Now right here, it says all the people, even the tax collectors, it says they acknowledge that God's way was right. How do they acknowledge it? By getting baptized. And the Bible says that the Pharisees and experts of the law, well, they rejected God's purpose. How do we know? Because they didn't get baptized. Here's the bottom line. If you do not get baptized, you are rejecting the purpose of God for your life. You know, last week we had uh, Danny baptized. And, you know, he's, he's an incredible young man, and I understand he's an incredible young actor. But that's not his purpose. His purpose is now just beginning to be realized. You say, well, what is it? We don't know yet. That's where faith comes on in. But if he hadn't gotten baptized, he wouldn't now be realizing the very purpose 
for which he was born. Now, you know, it's interesting to me that John the Baptist was tripped up because he had misconceptions about the Messiah, and his followers were tripped up about it, not only about the Messiah, but about the kingdom. You know, there are many people today whose faith has been damaged because they didn't expect all the chaos in the kingdom. And the problem is they just didn't get into the Word of God. Turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 24. All right, come on, Jesus prophesied these kind of days. He's talking to the apostles in verse 9. And he says, Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And he's talking about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD right there. Now for a lot of people, they're shocked that so many people fell away. That for so many people, their love grew cold. That so many people were betrayed. They just weren't in their Bibles. You need to understand, that should not shake your faith what other people do and how they turn away from God. Getting back to Luke. It's interesting to me that there are two groups. Those who accept God's purpose for their life, being baptized, and those that don't. And he breaks that group into the Pharisees and very interestingly put, experts in the law. Literally translated... In the Greek, it's lawyer scribes. Now, Matthew, whose gospel is to the Jews, only uses the word scribes. And I believe New International Version translates them teachers of the law. But Luke, of course, was writing to a Gentile audience. And scribe didn't really communicate to them, but lawyer scribe did. Essentially, what these guys did, they were usually an upper class uh, Jew who, yes, many times was a Pharisee, sometimes of the priestly class, who took the law and then applied that which the law did not speak directly about. Yet their authority came because they supposedly knew the law, and yet really what they were doing was interpreting the part that the law was silent on. And so it really caused Judaism to be distorted. And so now Jesus tells a parable. Let's look at it. Verse 31. So what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? Well, they're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other, we played the flute to you, and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge, and you didn't cry. But John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, he was a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all of her children. Commentators call this parable the parable of the spoiled brats. And it's very interesting. There's two group of kids right here. One group of kids is yelling to this group, We played the flute for you, you didn't dance. So the kids go going, Well, we sang a dirge and he didn't cry. (laughs) You didn't play the game my way. So I'm not going to play with you. (laughs) Now there's a huge irony. Two or three levels of irony that Jesus has put into this parable. Speakers, of course, are always leaders. Who's he talking about? The Pharisees and the scribe lawyers. Wow. He has them in conflict with each other in this particular parable. And yet there's an indirect reference to his ministry and to John the Baptist's ministry. The reference to Jesus' ministry, we played a flute for you and he didn't dance. Man, we were happy. We were upbeat. We sang a dirge and he didn't cry. That's John the Baptist. And some people think that it was a matter of style. And that's why John the Baptist got faked out. And yet, as Jesus says, John the Baptist came neither eating bread or drinking wine, and you say he's got a demon. The Son of Man came 
eating and drinking, you say, here's a glutton, a drunkard, a fine tax collector, it's a sinner. But wisdom is proved right by our children. What Jesus was saying at this time is very clear. He says, you wanted to write the rules, you wrote the rules, and when we would not play, then you rejected us. But in fact, we were the one, talking about him and John the Baptist, who were supposed to write the rules, and you refused to play because you're a bunch of spoiled brats who want your religion your way, and if it's not your way, you want no part of Jesus. He says, however, wisdom's proved right by all of her children, by those, of course, who accept the teachings of Jesus. Amen. You know, when I read this parable of the spoiled brats, I can't help but think about Lance Underhill. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Lance is in the house right over here. And he will testify that what I'm about to say is all truth. Lance lived in Florida and heard all about the first jubilee we had in Portland, Oregon. He heard a lot of good, and he heard so much more bad. And he goes, I wonder what's going on. And so, like the challenge of Jesus to the disciples of John the Baptist, he said, come and see. And so Lance came to Portland at the second jubilee. And he saw... Now, he saw a little murmuring by some of the Pharisees that were in the crowd. But what he saw was a group of people that still believed the world could be evangelized. A group of people that still believed that the true disciple is a sold-out disciple and there's no other kind. A group of people that believed that the only way to build the visible church was to call people one by one to be sold-out disciples. What really blew them away, though, was after the Jubilee, he went around with Vic Jr. over to Portland State. And he was seeing the campus ministry, and Vic was just showing the campus ministry. He said, oh, oh, there's one brother, he's studying with that guy. Oh, there's a couple sisters studying with that girl. And this, Lance hadn't been in the study for so long. And he was so convicted. But he goes, wow, I've seen the kingdom again. Flies back to Florida, so fired up. Talks to his wife, Connie. Say, Connie, I've seen it. It's in Portland. We gotta move. Connie goes, You need to come to your senses. We got three houses. What are you thinking about? He goes, Okay. And he stayed in Florida. Four months later, his last child of four said, I don't want to go to church anymore. It's boring. That kid's sitting right up here. That's Joey. At that time, Lance tells Connie, we're moving to Portland. In one month time, they came to Portland. Joey immediately started going to church. One month later, he's personally fruitful with a fellow high school student. Isn't it? After a couple years, Lance goes, bro, I want to be on the LA mission team because I've got to go get my derelict son, Mike Underhill. <laughs> This guy, he was an intern with the church, wow. turned his back on God, wow. now he's a bartender and living with a woman. Ooh. We gotta go get that boy. Come on, Mike. Get him. Come on, Mike. Ten months ago, Mike Underhill was restored and is now leading our teens. Amen. On, Many years ago, of course, they were in the church and their daughter, Alyssa, got baptized really young, as, as kingdom kids have a tendency to do. But she's just, just getting baptized just to get baptized. And as the years went by, it showed up more and more that she really wasn't a disciple. Well, her husband, who got restored up in Portland, dragged her on down here when the team and the family came. And today, Alyssa is being baptized into Christ. Amen? Now, there are four Underhill kids... And there's one more to go, that's Ray. But all, all the underhills say, he's a goner. He's going to come join us and everything. See, wisdom is proved right by our children. You look at Lance. You look at his family and say, listen, this
this man understood the kingdom. It cannot be compromised. And there's no price that you can put on a relationship with God and having a church where your family can come. This was what Jesus was pleading with the multitudes. Let's go to chapter 8. This next section of scripture shook me up this week. It totally changed my understanding and vision of the ministry of Jesus. Point two, proclamations to sort the multitudes. Verse one. Wow. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, of course, from the city of Magdala, which was close to Capernaum, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Cuzza, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Up to this point, Luke has put before us that Jesus came to save the whole world. And in his presentation, he says the world is composed of Jew and Gentile. And Jesus came to save both the Jew and the Gentile. Now he's going to sort the multitudes in a different way. He says not only has Jesus come to save the whole world, but the whole world can be divided into men and women. And so right here we get a glimpse of what Jesus' ministry is really all about. Commentators call chapter 8 through chapter 9, verse 50, the tour section of the ministry of Jesus. In other words, he went around preaching to all these cities and towns and villages. And quote, in his posse, in his entourage, we know there were the 12, right? Isn't that how you always picture it? The 12 guys? Peter, James, John, and the gang? That's not the picture Luke gives us. He gives us one of the most radical, unbelievable pictures for a first century preacher. He says, yes, the twelve were with Jesus. But there was Mary Magdalene. There was Joanna. There was Susanna and many others. Who was Mary Magdalene? She was honored with being the first person to see Jesus risen from the dead. Who is Joanna? Early traditions say that it was her husband who was the nobleman in John chapter 4 who had the son that was healed. Can you imagine a mom whose son was healed and the gratefulness she would have? But right here it also points out that Christianity now is seeping into the highest echelons of society, even in the Herod's household. And Susanna... Well, it means Lily, but there's nothing that we really know about Susanna, but why list three names? Because there's a parallel that he is trying to draw right here, quite simply and very obviously. Later on in this chapter, he's going to talk about three other names, Peter, James, and John. He does that again at the Mount of Transfiguration. Why? Because inside of the 12, there was even three that he focused even more upon in building this new Israel. And so what Luke is trying to get us to see is that, yes, it was common at that time for preachers to be itinerant, to travel. It was even common at that time to be supported financially by women. But it was absolutely radical to have women traveling in your tour. What Jesus is doing here, there were three main guys amongst the twelve, and there were three main women amongst the women, and there were other women. He was simply building a parallel structure of discipling for the men and the women. Is that incredible or not? And we go, well, that's a lot like us. No, 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 no. We're a lot like Jesus. You see what I'm saying? I think the other thing that comes strongly through this passage... Is, the, is that in the plan to evangelize the world, not only does there need to be discipleship amongst the men and discipleship amongst the women, but the women are the ones that step forward 
and gave generously. Yes, he was supported by a bunch of rich women. In contrast to the Pharisees who took advantage of the poor widows. See, we need to understand that the ministry of Jesus, yes, you only needed one Jesus, but the influence to influence men and women needed women leadership. We recognize it even here in the church. The Lord's allowed me and graced me to be able to be the lead evangelist here. Amen. Amen. And I have certain brothers that I work with and work through, and, and they're doing a wonderful job for the Lord. But my wife works with the women. I don't need to be working with the women. Elena works with the women. You know, sisters like Casey and Kathy Martinez and Lucy and Aurora and Liliana. I mean, and, and these are the women we would name as the ones that are discipling all the other women. Are you with me right here? You see, the plan to evangelize the world, yes, we must get to the Jews and Gentiles, but we must get to the men and the women. Are you with me here, church? Now, let's look at the passage where he sorts the multitudes again. Verse 4. Come on, talk about it. While a large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus from town after town. Do you just get this sense that more and more people are being drawn into this multitude right here? Is that crazy? He told him this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell on the path it was trampled on. And the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. When he said this, he called out, He was ears, let him hear. His disciples asked him what the parable meant. He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing, they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell amongst the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. You know, we often know this is the parable of the sower. It's probably better named the parable of the soils or the parable of the hearts. Because Jesus is really trying to call out people right here. This is well known, so we can sort through this, I think, fairly quickly. The path, Jesus talks about how the devil come and just swipes the seed away. But he also adds that little thing that it is trampled on. It's just not respected. People don't accept it at all. But right here, he's trying to show again this epic battle between Satan and God for the hearts of men. Secondly, different than in Matthew and Mark, he does not talk about a scorching sun that deals only with persecution. He stretches it more. He says, yes, the seed goes on the rocky soil, but there it lacks moisture and it dies. Talking about living water, the word of God. And he broadens it and he says, when times of testing come, which includes persecution, but other tests that we're well aware of, if there is no word of God in your life, you're going to die. Then he talks about how the seed falls among the thorns and the thistles. Uh And here the seed is choked to death by the worries of this life, the riches and the pleasures, and they do not mature. Well, what does maturity mean? Well, he explains it in the fourth soil. But the seed of the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart. Now, that was a a Greek expression in that day, that the person that had a noble and good heart was the ideal man. And so the ideal Christian is one where he accepts the word of God, the seed, he hears the word, he retains it, he perseveres, and then he produces a crop. So what is maturity? There's much discussion about that word. Well, right here, Jesus makes it quite clear. Maturity is the ability to produce a crop to make other disciples. Turn to Hebrews chapter 5. There's been a great deal of discussion on maturity and, frankly, a lot of wrong direction. 
Some have suggested that being mature is just hanging around longer than anybody else. <laughs> Others have suggested that being mature is just really knowing the Word of God backwards and forwards. Well, didn't the Pharisees and the yeah, lawyer scribes supposed to know the Word? Yeah. So what does the writer of the Hebrews have to say? In verse 11, chapter 5. We have much to say about this. But it's hard to explain because you're slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. Solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. See, we need to understand, God expects every disciple to become a teacher. Someone that teaches other people about God. And I think those of us that from time to time get distracted by the cares of life, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and we're not jumping in on studies, our hearts can get pretty hard, can't they? Yes. And we stop being fruitful, but we also start to get distant from God. And let's just lay this on out. Not once mature, always mature. Amen. Just because you baptized in the past does not mean you are our mature disciple now. There could be a whole thicket of thorns choking the life out of your spiritual life. Now, Jesus reiterates this in his teachings. Let's get back to the book of Luke. Go there. Luke himself lays it on out, beginning in verse 16. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, he puts it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away from him. Now, some might suggest that this is kind of the idea of letting your light shine. Well, it's certainly involved in there, but it's really not what he's talking about. He's talking about the light of the knowledge of Jesus right here. And so when he says, hey, listen carefully, he says, let the light come into your life because whoever has will be given more. He says, if you're really letting the light come in, you're going to get more wisdom. But whoever does not have, even that will be taken away from him. So his first challenge right here to sort everybody is you got to listen to the word of God. you got to be careful about it. Then look at the next account. Verse 19. Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. But they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. He replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. So now he's gone from listening he says you got to obey it. And of course, in the scriptures, they always go to the most extreme situation. And right here, he says, hey, even Jesus had a conflict in his physical family, but he wasn't confused about his priorities. Yes. Amen. When his mother and his physical brothers wanted him to do something, he says, hey, my real family, my mother and my brothers and my sister are those who obey the Word of God. How tough of teaching is that? Come on, bro. You see, God makes it very clear. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. Amen. We must seek God and His kingdom. The kingdom goes beyond the church. There are a whole bunch of teachings with it. But it includes the church. It includes our spiritual family. And then comes our physical family. Then our jobs and then any church leadership or other things. But we need to make sure that we have our priorities right. When if you don't have your priorities right, you cannot obey the Word of God. And if there's anything that I've seen, even in this past week, I've talked to several people, is that particularly with remnant people, they've become so spiritually disoriented by the hits that have come into their physical families. Wives, husbands, parents, children. And it's consumed them to the point that their spiritual life is almost taken away. Wow. This is what's so powerful about the Underhill's life. Yeah. Lance and Connie stepped up and says, man, we want to be on a mission team because we want to build a church where our kids can come 
and worship God. Amen? Amen. Look at the last story right here. Verse 22. One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. You know, it's hard healing people. Amen, guys? We're going to find our next passage that whenever he heals somebody, he feels the power go out from him. You know, if you're working hard for the Lord, you're going to be tired at night. A squall came down the lake, so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. Luke's subtle right there. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up, rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who, who is this? He commands even the winds and the waters, and they obey him. Right here, the teaching's clear. Yes, you got to first listen, and then you got to obey. But then you got to trust. You got to persevere. You got to trust even in the midst of life's storms. And storms happen to those that are disciples as well as to those that are not disciples. The difference is whether you listen, obey, and trust. You know, that wedding yesterday was just incredible. And if there's any person that just exemplifies that fourth soil of a noble and good heart, it's Carl Wick. <laughs> See, we sent a mission team down from Portland down to a small remnant group in Phoenix, Arizona. In a lot of our churches in America, we like to build an English ministry and a Spanish ministry. Even at this moment, we have a, a Spanish ministry meeting a few doors down right here because we want the gospel preached in people's native language, amen, in their heart language. Well, anyway, they got on down there and it was, it was amazing. They were all ready for their inaugural service. And frankly speaking, the, the Spanish ministry was very small. And Carl had been asked to lead it. And as the leader, he was looking forward to the inaugural service. But it came to be 5 o'clock on Saturday afternoon. And he had no visitors. So what did he do? Called up Vic Sr., his disciple. He said, bro, I got no visitors. What do I do? He says, you need to go out and preach the word. Oh, okay. And just believe that when you preach the word, someone's going to listen and someone's going to come. Now, of course, leading the Spanish ministry, he goes, okay, where do I need to go? He went to a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> well, at the Mexican restaurant, this waitress came up to him, and that was Patty. He invited Patty out. She came to church the next day, the only visitor for the whole Spanish ministry. And Carl just preached to her, amen. <laughs> she was fired up. Helen set up a Bible study, and she was baptized a couple weeks later. Is that awesome? You see, this was a noble and good heart that persevered and produced a crop, not only a baptized disciple, but a wife that's going to be near and dear to him. Amen, guys? See, I think there's a great lesson right there for a lot of the single people. You know, we worry about, okay, where are we going to find someone to marry? This is so, the church is so small and everything. Listen, you need to be faithful to God, and God will be faithful to you. Are you with me here, church? Let's move on in the text right here. Verse 26. Persecuted by the multitudes. They sailed to the region of Gerasenes. Now that's the, the Gentile side. That's the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but lived in the tombs. When they saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me! For Jesus has commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. And though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and been driven by the demon into solitary places. Mark adds that he would cry out all night and cut himself with stones. You know, we look at this man and our heart goes out to him. Living amongst the tombs, the dead. Crying out at night in emotional and spiritual pain. Demon-possessed. 
and yet having nothing. You know, I think sometimes we get so used to our suburban world that as disciples, we forget all the pain that's out there. I'll never forget, a few years ago, I got home from Wednesday night church here in L.A., and there was this frantic phone call. Spro, this is Craig. I need to talk to you tonight. I didn't know who it was. I called back, and I said, who is this? He says, it's me, Craig. I said, I, I don't know you. He says, oh, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm the waiter at your favorite restaurant, Guido's. I said, well, what, what, what can I do for you? He says, I am having the worst night of my life. He says, I've just gotten the point of just, I, I don't want to live anymore. And I've been on the phone with my sister for the last couple of hours. And she's kept on saying, is there someone you can talk to? Someone at work, he says, no, 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 they got the same problems as me. They're into drugs, they're into the world, they don't have any answers. Well, how about your roommates? No, they got the same problems. He says, there must be someone. And Craig said, well, look down the floor. And he saw a card. He says, well, maybe there's someone. I'd given him a card a couple of months before with my name and number. And she said, call him. He called. I wasn't there, but I called back. We talked. And a couple weeks later, Craig Fabian was baptized into Christ. I think sometimes, guys, we look at stories like this. That's just in the Bible. The pain that's out there is beyond anything you can imagine. And if we don't reach out to people, even seemingly if they don't respond at the moment, because... Jesus at first said to this guy, hey, evil spirit, come out. Nothing happened. Well, why? Well, let's read on. Come on. Yeah. Verse 30. Jesus asked him, what's your name? Legion. That would, whoa, can you imagine being a disciple right at that point? Well, baby, you know. <laughs> Here, but because many demons had gone into him. See, that's why he didn't respond. See, maybe the reason people don't respond to you at first, they don't have just one demon. They got a bunch of them. And they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go down to them, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Well, you know, the whole idea of legion carries a lot of things. It has a military sense to it because once more, Luke wants to remind us of the battle. And seemingly the overwhelming odds that even Jesus and the disciple has. But with Jesus, even the overwhelming odds, he will be victorious through. Amen, guys? Verse 34. When those tending the pigs saw what happened, they ran off, reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Now they're afraid of this guy. Here he is, dressed, sitting there, calm, cool, collected, and now they're freaked out. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. Mark records that the number of pigs that were killed was 2,000. That's how many demons there were. And when these pigs got demon-possessed, they ran off the cliff and drowned in the water. And yes, the guy was saved. He was healed. But the people were furious. Someone told me that the price of a pig these days is about $100. 2,000 pigs, the price of that man's soul was $200,000. And the people said the price is too much. We do not want to pay that price for salvation. Is their price too high for you to pay? You know, we're, here we are right now. A time of recession. And as disciples, you know, here we are. We have a baby church. We've just been going on for about 11 months right now. Lord's blessing us. Amen, guys. But... 
it's still going to take incredible sacrifice financially. I mean, the women sacrificed for Jesus. And we've got to understand, we've got to sacrifice for Jesus. I mean, if we're going to continue to see people being added to the body of Christ. And I really want to commend the church overall. You've done a great job in your giving. On the other hand, let's not back down because the recession makes it tough. Let's trust in the Lord right here and keep on sacrificing for the Lord. Are you with me right here, church? Verse 38. The man of whom the demon had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. See, some people need to go with Jesus to New York and other people need to be with Jesus here in L.A. Are you with me right here? So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Well, even though this whole town, this multitude, persecuted Jesus, here was a man that just went out and told everyone how much Jesus had done for him. You know, it's very interesting. Mark gives us a little bit different glimpse. It says, after he had been cured and brought into his right mind, he went and preached to the Decapolis. In other words, this 10-city area. He was really fired up. Are you with me right here? Now, Matthew adds another twist to it. Go, go to Matthew chapter 8. See if you can pick up the twist that Matthew puts on it. Beginning in verse 28. When Jesus arrived at the other side of the region of the Gadarenes, Two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into that herd of pigs. Well, you know, it's amazing. In the Luke account, as well as Mark, we see the guys landing, and what comes out of the tomb? But this nude guy. Matthew says, no! There were two nude guys that came out of the tombs. Why? I think it's simple. And really, the answer for us lies in the Mark passage. As of today, we're going to have two baptisms. And many times we have two, three, whatever. But sometimes, after someone's baptized, they have such a noble and good heart, they persevere to such extent that they become mature and become a preacher for the Lord. It's not that the souls are not equally important, but the impact is determined by how much we really love the Lord and how much we want to give up for Him. You see, what happened is this one demoniac Loved Jesus so much, he gave up everything so that he could serve the Lord. Yes, that's what it takes to be a preacher. How about it, even in this room? Do some of you dare take that challenge? To leave everything you've got and say, listen, I want to be a preacher. I want to go full time for the Lord. You know, I appreciate Melina Zapata right here. I mean, here is Melina. She's been here in the States the last couple of years learning English. She's from Santiago. Matt and Helen are going back down to Santiago in a couple months. And she's willing to lay up all the wealth in the United States and say, listen, I'm going back to my home nation, my hometown, so I can be a full-time intern. And she'll be a full-time intern this August in Santiago, Chile. Amen. Is that awesome, church? Let's finish up this passage. Plans for each in the multitude. Let's get back to Luke. Chapter 9. Verse 40. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him. For they're all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. Wow, does that hit your heart? His little girl, his only daughter. As Jesus was on the way, the crowds almost crushed him. Okay, here's the multitude again. Now the multitudes are so huge that they're just crushing Jesus. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. But no one could heal her. 
She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know the power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith is healed. You go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter's dead, he said. Don't bother to teach her anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Do not be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. When he arrived in the house of Jairus, he didn't let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told him to give him something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. And you think you have a busy day, amen? <laughs> Plans for each in the multitude. I mean, can you imagine this setting? I mean, the crowds, the multitudes have gotten so big that Jesus is literally getting physically crushed by all the people that want to be around him. First of all, Jerry comes and says, he says, Master, you've got to come. My only daughter, my 12-year-old daughter is dying. Will you please come and save her? She says, absolutely. On his way, in the midst of this crowd, he goes, stop. Who touched me? And Peter says, man, uh, Master, there's tons of people around. How, how can you ask who touched you? He says, I felt the power go out from me. And then all of a sudden, the Bible says, this trembling woman, knowing that she couldn't, couldn't hide who she was anymore, came forward. Now, the issue with this woman, most likely, was that she had a uterine hemorrhage. In other words, she had a period all through the day, all through the week, all through the years. Not only... Would that be a lot of physical pain and cramps? But it was such an embarrassing problem that it even carried a social stigma and law against that she would be perpetually, ceremonially unclean. She could have no fellowship. No wonder she didn't go to Jesus and say, Hey, I, I need some help. And he would have said, What's your problem? She was so embarrassed by her problem. And yet she went in hope and faith and touched the hem of his garment. And she was immediately healed. And yet the Bible says right here, then the woman, verse 47, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, as in the previous passage, when you come to Jesus, you got to bring everything into the light. Even the embarrassing and the uncomfortable. She came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him. She just got flat open about her life. You know, sometimes people are really taken aback in our church when they come the first few times. Even more than a few three times. <laughs> and someone gets up here and says, you know something? I was an adulterer. I went to jail. I had two abortions. I was a homosexual. I was molested as a kid. I molested kids. And here in the church, when someone gets up, confesses their sins, we know they've come into the light. And we, there's no condemnation of this person because that's us. We're just fired up someone else joined us and came into the light. And so here is this woman. For 12 years she kept this bottled up inside. No one to talk to. In her mind, condemned by God. Cursed of God. 
And now, she finds relief and peace in Jesus. I not only find it fascinating about the analogy of the light coming through, but also how Jesus addresses her. He says, daughter. Why? She's now a sister in the faith. Amen? Because that is who is our mother, our brother, and our sister. Those who obey the word of God. Isn't it wonderful how Luke just weaves the themes back and forth? However, at the very end, what a touching scene. Right as he has the woman healed, someone comes and says, Jerry's daughter has died. Don't bother the master anymore. And Jesus just turns to Jarius and says, Hey, don't be afraid. Just believe. And she will be healed. They go to the house. See all these mourners. I mean, it's, it's incredible. For Jesus, this is a great opportunity. See, the mourners were loud. So that brought a bigger crowd, amen, to preach to. <laughs> Secondly, he got to rebuke their lack of faith. And yet when he rebuked them, they laughed at him. Yet he went on in with only Peter, James, and John. There's our triumphant again. You see it right there? The focusing on a few. And he went on in, and he just simply goes up to the little girl and says, My child, get up. The Bible says her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. And I love this. Then Jesus told them, Go get her something to eat. It's kind of like a doctor. Well, her pulse is good. Let's get the child something to eat. After all, Jesus is the great physician. Amen, church? Amen. You know, this focus on a few is clear. Peter, James, and John. The transfiguration, Gethsemane. Jesus focused on a few so that he could win the multitude. Amen. You know, I feel like this week is a very special week for the church to really understand winning the multitude. I'm, I'm so inspired that this young lady, Thrissia, is getting baptized today. Um, she's from Brazil. She's about 17 years old. She goes to Santa Monica College. And she's a model. Interestingly enough, and of course, we don't believe by chance, but by God. Amen. Last week, right across the hall... They had this, the, the, the actual filming of America's Next Top Model. Matter of fact, when I came down the hall, I go, oh, gee, many Christmas, I got it. <laughs> I mean, it's really bad if you sin right before you preach. You know what I'm talking about right there? You know the Lord is going to smote you on the spot. So I'm going like this. <laughs> but I guess Theresia came, and, and to her, it was like her life. Here, on the left, was America's next top model. Here on the right was the Church of Jesus Christ. And it became clear to her, you can't mix the two. Wow. And she says, you know something? I want the Church of Jesus Christ. You see, I think, to me, she represents... The Gentile world. Earlier this week, a young man that means a lot to me, Jonathan Green, was baptized. Now, Jonathan means a lot to me because his dad was actually in my Bible talk when I was a college student. I led his dad's Bible talk. So I've watched Jonathan grow up through the years. He's what DJ refers to as a a kingdom kid. And Jonathan, Jonathan... Got baptized young. He understood baptism. He understood what he was supposed to do. But as the years passed, he wondered why he never bore fruit. His dad sat down with him just a week or so ago. And he says, son, have you ever considered you don't have the spirit? That you never really have been a disciple? And as Jonathan wrestled with it, it was kind of interesting. He says, you know something, Kip? Some of the criticism I received as being kind of the the poster child for kingdom kids was true. He says, my life was go and make friends, not go and make disciples. And I have a lot of friends, but no impact. 
He says, I realize what I need to do. I need to make Jesus Christ Lord. I need to start living like Jesus. And instead of just making friends, I need to make disciples. You see, to me, he represents all the Jews. The people raised with the truth. But got to respond to it by listening, obeying, and trusting in the word of God. You know, very interesting, at this, at this hour, our sister church in Phoenix, which was just planted just about a year and a half ago, and I'm so excited. They're just a, a small group of, I expect, about 75 disciples, have about 150 on Sunday. Today, they're having five baptisms. Is that awesome? Wow. They're also having a restorations. And you know something? You say, well, who are the five baptists? Well, I only know one of them. It's Chris Klopek's mom that's getting baptized. He just baptized his dad about a year and a half ago. But, but the other ones, I don't know. But you know something? God does. See, right now, God is discipling 7 billion people. He's got a plan for 7 billion. That's a multitude. But he has a plan for each person. See, he had a plan for Jairus. He had a plan for Jairus' daughter. He had a plan with that woman with an issue of blood. He had a plan for Peter, James, and John. He had a plan for the mom and dad of Jairus' daughter. Jesus has a plan for everyone. And though individuals here may not know you, God has a plan for you. But in order to realize that plan, you got to be baptized to accept the purpose of God and to understand that you've got to have that noble and good heart that perseveres so that in this generation, all the multitudes will know that Jesus is the Son of God. Thank you.